Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings that you have showered upon us this day. We thank you that we can come here this evening to hear more from your word, to learn more of what you're trying to teach us in order to be true, godly women. We know that as the world gets darker, we need to shine brighter, that the world needs to see examples of true Christians. We pray that each of us would be those examples. We ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us now and lift our thoughts heavenward as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. This evening we're going to look at the principles of being a true woman. We already discussed about courtship and marriage, now I'm going to move on to how a true woman behaves, what our jobs are, what our role is in marriage. Before we start, what is Christ waiting for? Let's read our memory text together. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. And where is it found? Yes, Christ Object Lessons, page 69. So, self-sacrifice. Not one in twenty of those who have a good standing with Seventh-day Adventists is living out the self-sacrificing principles of the Word of God. So, not one in 20 of Adventists that we see around is really a true Seventh-day Adventist and is really willing to sacrifice as Christ wants us to. So what is a true woman like? Proverbs 31, 10 to 12 says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So here a true, pure, virtuous woman can be trusted by her husband to behave in a morally pure way and he will have faith in her that she will be faithful to him. She will do him good and not evil. So we'll treat our husbands well. They'll be happy in our presence and we won't do them evil. We won't bring them harm, even by our words, not just our actions. Let's look at the submission of Eve. Eve was told of the sorrow and pain that must henceforth be her portion. And the Lord said, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. In the creation God had made her the equal of Adam. Had they remained obedient to God, in harmony with his great law of love, they would ever have been in harmony with each other. But sin had brought discord, and now their union could be maintained and harmony preserved, only by submission on the part of the one or the other. So in the beginning, God had intended that we be equal. But again, he brings good out of evil. When the sin came in, his promise to us was that one of us, that we should have a desire towards our husband, and he chose the man to be the one to lead out. We're told at the bottom of this quote that they could, we could only have harmony and union in our marriages if one of us has the leading role. And God ordained it that the man should have that leading role. So this submission of the wife to the husband is a God-ordained thing for our happiness. And we're not to look at it as a, as a grievous yoke or a burden that Christ has placed upon us as women. So woman in subjection to her husband. Eve had been the first in transgression and she had fallen into temptation by separating for her companion, contrary to the divine direction. It was by her solicitation that Adam sinned and she was now placed in subjection to her husband. Had the principles enjoined in the law of God been cherished by the fallen race, this sentence, though growing out of the results of sin, would have proved a blessing to them. But man's abuse of the supremacy thus given him has too often rendered the lot of woman very bitter and made her life a burden. So we need to separate what's happened in society and the burden that's been placed on women over the years and over the generations and the perversion of this relationship from God's intention when he gave Adam that supremacy. After sin, it was his, he put this in place for our protection, that we would be subject to our husbands. And because it's been abused doesn't mean that that principle is bad in itself. It was to be a blessing given by God. So we as women should take up our life duties cheerfully, recognizing that God has ordained this role for us. Eve had been perfectly happy by her husband's side in her Eden home, but like restless modern Eves, she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than that which God had assigned her. 
In attempting to rise above her original position, she fell far below it. A similar result will be reached by all who are unwilling to take up cheerfully their life duties in accordance with God's plan. So if we're not willing to be submissive wives, take up our life's duties around our home, in our domestic situation, and do the work that God is calling us to do, and especially if we have children, our first work is to those children. It's not to go out and get a job, to be ambitious, to rise up in a company as a businesswoman, unless God is specifically calling someone to that, and, and they're not married, and they don't have the responsibilities of a household, maybe single woman may be called to do those things, but we need to seriously consider our responsibility as the person who runs the household and we're to cheerfully take up those small duties that the world looks down upon so you may not be the leader of a company and running your own business and getting the admiration and respect of the world you may be just just in your home as a mother but god looks upon that as one of the highest callings so husband and wife we're talk ephesians talks about the relationship between husbands and wives in Ephesians 5, 22 to 24, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And we recognise that this relationship between us and Christ is a very positive one. Everything that Christ asks us to do is for our benefit. Everything that he does for us is with our happiness and our interests at heart. And this is the same relationship that God wants to husbands and wives to have. So if the husband is really considering the wife's feelings, her affections, her needs, then it will not be a hard thing for the wife to submit to such a husband who has Christ as his head. And it will be not hard to make ourselves subject to them and in everything. So even when we disagree, this is a principle that needs to be followed because somebody has to make a decision in the household. So there may be times when your husband does something or makes a decision for the family that you don't agree with, but as a wife, it's our place to submit unless it is forcing us to break God's commandments and to go contrary to what God has asked us to do. But there are situations where it's not a moral principle where we have to submit our will and our feelings to the husband. What does submit mean? It means to be subordinate, to place in order or rank below something else, be under obedience to. And so he is the leader, he has the final say. And I know husbands and wives who have testified that this principle works. Even when the husband, I know a couple where the wife described the situation, the husband had made a, a choice, she told him she didn't agree with it, but she supported him in the choice. And when she's done that, several times that happened, and nearly every time, when it didn't go according to plan, and it was clearly a wrong decision, the husband came back to the wife and apologized and recognized that she had been right, and he saw it. But it was after she submitted, and they went through with the decision, that he was able to see his mistakes too. And we as wives have to remember that our husbands have a hard time they are subject to god directly we can actually be subject to our husband and he's a human being standing there in the flesh whereas the husband has to go to god he can't see god he has to rely by faith on what god's telling him to do as well and i think sometimes as wives we need more understanding of the husband's position in this order so it continues husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it and this is a principle, this principle of giving oneself that is so often overlooked by, by men when they quote that women should submit. Often it's unrighteous people quoting these things out of context. But we need to remember that Christ gave himself completely and fully to us when he died for us on the cross. And that if each husband would do that for the wife, then the wife could happily submit. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So he's saying here that no man treats himself badly, so why should he treat his wife badly? He should treat his wife just like he treats his own flesh, how he nourishes and looks after himself. He should do the same for the wife. But what does it mean to nourish? Nourisheth means to rear up to maturity, to cherish or train. So the husband does have a responsibility to see that his wife has a mature Christian walk and is able to, to cope mentally, spiritually, physically with her 
duties with her family. He's to there to help and cherish and train her up in the way that she should go too. So he does have a responsibility for her. Cherisheth means to treat with tenderness and affection, to give warmth, ease or comfort to. So the husband should recognise the emotional needs of the wife and her physical needs. If she's worn out, she's tired, she's had a long day. When he comes in, he still needs to treat her with warmth and tenderness and bring her comfort. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So it's God's will that just like Christ is united to us, then we walk, we're one with Christ, and our will becomes his will, that in a marriage relation that the two become one, that they're united in their decisions, their choices, that they can walk together in harmony. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. And this principle is something that needs to be followed even in situations where people are married to unbelievers. There are sad situations where people convert to the Lord, they're already married, and their marriage is difficult and it's a struggle after one of them converts. And if the wife converts, she still needs to reverence her husband who is an unbeliever. And so many stories are told where when people do that, that the husband gradually over time can change, can see that his wife loves him and can see that her principles are good ones and can respect her for that. It's very difficult, but this is something we can still put in practice, even if the husband is an unbeliever. Reverence means fear mingled with respect and esteem, admiration of something great with love and affection. So and all husbands need to know that their wife respects them. The worst thing we can do is to show that we don't have any respect for our husband, especially in public. And even if your husband is not meeting the criteria or living up to all the light that you think he should be, we can still respect him and ha look at the good things. Look at the things that attracted you to him in the first place. Look at the positive things and affirm those positive things that you see and without concentrating on the weaknesses and pray for the weaknesses. This is the best thing that we can do because so often you hear married couples and it works both ways, putting each other down in public and this is just so detrimental to the marriage relation and as Christians in general shouldn't be doing this anyway but it's very easy to do even in a joking, jesting way it's something we as, as wives need to be conscious of, that we don't put our husbands down in public and that we show them that respect and esteem. Man was designated as the priest of the home. To the man who is a husband and a father, I would say, be sure that a pure holy atmosphere surrounds your soul. As priest and houseband of your family, you are to learn daily of Christ. Never, never are you to show a tyrannical spirit in the home. The man who does this is working in partnership with satanic agencies. Bring your will into submission to the will of God. Do all in your power to make the life of your wife pleasant and happy. So although this counsel is given to the husband, it's for us as wives to recognize that he has that role and not to take it from him, even if he doesn't perform it or he's not doing it a good job at it. We can't take that from him and take away his, his manhood and his leadership role in the home. We need to pray earnestly that he takes up this responsibility and does it because many times I hear um, complaints from women that their husband is not doing this, that they are not the spiritual leader of the home, especially in our society where women are given so much more responsibility now. They've become, they're wearing the trousers in many circumstances, not just in the world, but spiritually in the church as well. There's a lack of godly leaders in the church and we need to re really earnestly intercede for the men in the church and especially our own husbands that they take this role seriously and even if they don't know we need to have our own devotional life and pray for them that they're able to do this and they see the importance of it houseband and teacher the father is to be the houseband of the family this is his position and if he is a christian he will maintain family government in every respect his authority is to be recognized so this authority is to be recognized not by us, just by us as a wife, but also by, by the children. And children very quickly pick up if the wife does not respect the husband and is not treating him, giving him the authority that he is due as, as the leader of the home. And so it's very important when training children to give them this right example that even if he's not doing everything right, the husband is still the leader of the home, that their father is to be respected. The husband is the houseband, the husband, the priest of the household, and the wife is the teacher. As she shall fill her place in the household, whatever may be her employment, if she has children to nurse and take care of, let me tell you there is a lesson there.
Oh, such a lesson that God wants everyone to learn. The wife united with the husband in the fear of God is to be a strength and power in the church. God can make them thus. So here we have it detailed that the husband is the priest and although he's to lead out spiritually and to nurture the, the members of his family spiritually, the wife is also a teacher, especially of the children. Her first work is to her children and the first training comes to the wife. Even if the children go to school at four or five, she's had four or five years there to mold their characters. So it's essential to see that these role distinctions that God has given us and that we as women can still be a strength and a power in the church, even if we're not the spiritual leader at home. We need to appreciate other, each other. Let each give love rather than exact it. Cultivate that which is noblest in yourselves and be quick to recognize the good qualities in each other. The consciousness of being appreciated is a wonderful stimulus and satisfaction. Sympathy and respect encourage the striving after excellence and love itself increases as it stimulates to nobler aims. So we need to appreciate the good qualities of our husband and wife and affirm them and tell them how much we love them, how much we appreciate them. Be thankful and gracious to them when they do things for you. And it's important with women especially, I think we're very needy emotionally that we expect a lot of love, but we're told here to give love rather than exact it. So don't have certain standards and, and measurements that we need the husband to look up to, that we should give them love regardless of how they're behaving and how their walk with God is going. And this is something that is a challenge to people because we're so used to, if, we, if we're nice, we should, people should be nice back, but it isn't always the case. And so we have to learn to, to, to give even when we don't get. And that's, that's the Christian walk. And this is why marriage is such a good object lesson because it teaches us how to be Christ-like. Because Christ gave getting nothing back. He gave and people didn't understand his mission. They didn't understand him, but he loved them into the kingdom of heaven. And this is what we need to do for our spouses. We need to love them and give them love, even when they don't meet all our standards and all our needs, seemingly. Do not try to compel them. Neither the husband nor the wife should attempt to exercise over the other an arbitrary control. Do not try to compel each other to yield to your wishes. You cannot do this and retain each other's love. Be kind, patient and forbearing, considerate and courteous. By the grace of God, you can succeed in making each other happy, as in your marriage vow you promised to do. And this is something that God is trying to teach each of us, that we need to allow the other person the freedom to make their choices and not compel them to do what we want them to do and not withdraw our affection and our love when they don't do what we want them to do. We put conditions so often on our relationships with people. If they do this, I won't like them anymore. I won't talk to them or I won't do this for them. I've done so much for you and you haven't done anything for me. This attitude comes into marriage when we're losing our hold on Christ and we're looking at the faults in the person. And it's something that has to be really guarded against, especially when you're first married and you see things about the person that you didn't know before as things unfold before you. It's important that you continually affect Firm each other and see the good in each other. So we're to still stand as an equal with our husband. Woman, if she wisely improves her time and her faculties, relying upon God for wisdom and strength, may stand on an equality with her husband as advisor, counsellor, companion and co-worker, and yet lose none of her womanly grace or modesty. Why should not women cultivate the intellect? Why should they not answer the purpose of God in their existence? Why may they not understand their own powers and realizing that these powers are given of God, strive to make use of them to the fullest extent in doing good to others, in advancing the work of reform, of truth and real goodness in the world? So when we say that the man is the leader, we're to submit to them. We're not saying that the woman doesn't have any say, that she can't advise, counsel, be a companion and a co-worker with her husband. And God encourages men and women to work together in his work. And we see an example of that with Ananias and Sapphira when they went around teaching the people. No, it's not Ananias and Sapphira. In the New Testament, we do see a couple who go around teaching the people together. And this is something that God encourages that each of us support and nurture and help each other. So this is a role that the wife needs to play too. She needs to be friend to her husband and give him help and support and counsel. And there is a work for women to do. The Lord has a work for women as well as for men. They may take their places in his work at this crisis, and he will work through them. 
If they are imbued with a sense of their duty and labor under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they will have just the self-possession required for this time. The Savior will reflect upon these self-sacrificing women the light of his countenance and will give them a power that exceeds that of men. They can do in families a work that men cannot do, a work that reaches the inner life. They can come close to the hearts of those whom men cannot reach. Their labor is needed. And I think that, that primarily this quote is referring to the fact that there are often women and, and children were at home. And it was only another woman that could reach that woman in the home in a way that, another ma that a man couldn't. So there is a work that we as women have been called to do that the men cannot do. And God will give us the power and the grace to do that work. So each of us individually need to go to him and say, what would thou have me do, Lord? We have an earnest desire that woman shall fill the position which God originally designed as her husband's equal. We so much need mothers who are mothers not merely in name but in every sense that the word implies. We may safely say that the dignity and importance of woman's mission and distinctive duties are of a more sacred and holy character than the duties of man. And this goes contrary to so much of what society teaches us, that the man is the one with the with the important job. He's going out doing the breadwinning. He's the one that's looked up to and admired by society. And the woman is just staying at home looking after the children. But those duties, because she's shaping those characters for eternity, are seen by God as more sacred and holy than the duties of men. And we as women need to embrace that because our society has gone so much towards women working outside of the home to the neglect of their children and their homely duties that we put these things up on a pedestal and we really downgrade the role of a mother. But God sees things not as man sees them. In fact, the other way around, the role of a mother is far more important than the role of a businesswoman. There's a work in our neighborhoods that we need to do. Women who have the cause of God at heart can do a good work in the districts in which they reside. In the various branches of the work of God's cause, there is a wide field in which our sisters may do good service for the master. Among the noble women who have had the moral courage to decide in favor of the truth for this time are many who have tact, perception and good ability and who may make successful workers. The labors of such Christian women are needed. So we should be going to our neighbors and ministering unto them. We'd also to be Bible teachers. There are women who are especially adapted for the work of giving Bible readings and they are very successful in presenting the Word of God in its simplicity to others. They become a great blessing in reaching mothers and their daughters. This is a sacred work and those engaged in it should receive encouragement. So again, we can still be teachers to other women and children. We're told that we would make Bible um, instructors. Exert an influence for good. Wonderful is the mission of the wives and mothers and the younger women workers. If they will, they can exert an influence for good to all around them. By modesty in dress and circumspect deportment, they may bear witness to the truth in its simplicity. A truly converted woman will exert a powerful, transforming influence for good. Connected with her husband, she may aid him in his work and become the means of encouragement and blessing to him. When the will and way are brought into subjection to the Spirit of God, there is no limit to the good that can be accomplished. So when we're really surrendered to God, God can use us to really be a blessing, not just to people in the world, but to our own husbands, because husbands need someone at their side to be their help meet. I mean, that was the role that we were given in the beginning. Often it becomes quite a chore to do your housework and to, to do the daily duties of life when they're unrecognized and unthanked by many, by many, even your own husband. But we need to recognize that God says here that housework is serving him. Those who do the cooking and the other work of the home are as verily engaged in the service of God as are those engaged in Bible work. And they are in greater need of sympathy and compassion. For there is in spiritual lines of work that which keeps the spirits cheered, uplifted and comforted. And remember, we are all servants. The one who does your housework is no less highly regarded by the Lord than the one whose work is to give Bible readings. And it's the same in the church with evangelists and pastors are looked upon as a high, as the highest work and as to, to be sought after and to be looked up to. But we're told that it's the people that do the lowly jobs are regarded by God as just as important as the people that do the so-called high jobs. So it's really 
encouraging to see this quote that when we're cooking and doing the work around the household, God is smiling upon us. The king upon his throne has no higher work than has the mother. The mother is queen of her household. She has in her power the molding of her children's characters that they may be fitted for the higher immortal life. An angel could not ask for a higher mission, for in doing this work she is doing service for God. Let her only realize the high character of her task and it will inspire her with courage. Let her realize the worth of her work and put on the whole armor of God that she may resist the temptation to conform to the world's standard. Her work is for time and for eternity. And this is something, that, especially in our day and age, that we need to bring out as Adventists. Because so often the, ro the role of the mother is just played down in society. We have children are sent to daycare, women are out to work. And the financial situation in families now is such that people often feel forced that the wife has to work as well as the husband. But I've seen many situations where the woman denies herself in the sense of going out to work and stays at home with the children to follow this counsel and God still blesses their financial needs. So this is a matter of faith just like any other principle we're given that we shouldn't be bound about by what society says and the restrictions of society financially and we shouldn't let that stop us doing God's work. Because this, when we look at a country, the most important person in the whole country is the king and is to be admired and respected and looked up to by the nation. And yet we're told that the mother's work is higher than the king's. So what are the things that are pitfalls for women? M many women, many of us, we have um, emotional problems and we rely on our emotions many times to make decisions instead of following God's voice and principle. And one of the things that we do especially when we're married, is to take our troubles to other people. When we're counseled to take our troubles to God, a third person is taken into the confidence of the wife and her private family matters are laid open before the special friend. This is the device of Satan to estrange the hearts of the husband and wife. Oh, that this would cease. What a world of trouble would be saved. Lock within your own hearts the knowledge of each other's faults. Tell your troubles alone to God. He can give you right counsel and sure consolation, which will be pure, having no bitterness in it. And this is a, I found this to be a personal pitfall when I first got married and, and your husband doesn't meet your expectations, he's not doing certain things. And this may be just your own expectations or they may even be God's expectations too. But so often we go to our friends or family members and we share our concerns and our problems and our trials. And we do this at every level, not just about our marriage, but about things we might be struggling with. When, so, when we're counseled that many of these things we should take directly to God because he has promised that he will be our counselor and he will be our strength to know how to deal with the situation the best way and what to do. I want to just put a proviso in there that there is a place for godly counsel. And we are counseled to get a counsel from a multitude of counselors and that's a good thing in certain situations. But many times what we generally do is we put our husband down and we put them in a bad light we're obviously giving our side of the story. The husband isn't there to defend themselves. And so often this is Satan's device to make you verbalize the problems you're having with your husband, which reinforces these problems in your mind. And you take them back in there and you have resentment build up, bitterness against your husband, and it just makes the situation worse. So we need to pray earnestly if we need counsel on a certain area and who we go and talk to about it and what the reason is for us talking. Because we as human beings, so often we just want sympathy. So we're actually not telling the problems because we want someone to help us with them. We're telling them because we want their sympathy. And that's where we need to make a distinction. Another pitfall that Ellen White highlights for women is reading fiction. Fictitious reading has confused the mind and marriage is falsely colored. As Christians, we should discard all this class of reading that creates so much unhappiness in the married life. Persons do not realize their expectations and nothing that the companion can do is pleasing. The one in this dangerous position should center the affections upon God and drink of the water that Christ shall give, which will be as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. As we know, much of the books that are written about romance and marriage are slanted in a way to to create false expectation in us that when our husband doesn't look a certain way or he doesn't wear certain things or he doesn't say certain things, he doesn't meet our expectation and this creates division and discord. Another downfall is us as women is impatience and fault finding. Oh, I have been shown how he exalts, Satan that is, when we are overcome and the spirit of impatience and fault finding is indulged. He is in an exaltation of triumph 
for he knows that this grieves the Spirit of God and separates us from our strength. Our words must be faultless, our spirit patient and kind, forbearing, long-suffering, and we manifesting by our words and actions that we have learned of Jesus and are still learning in the school of Christ. And this is something we need to pray more often, I think, that the Lord would guard our mouths and control our tongues and help us because many times in a situation where we've got frustration and irritation with our spouse, we speak words that afterwards we regret. Many times if we just learn to keep silent and pray, we would overcome many of the difficulties that we face because we've said unkind and hurtful things. And it's much easier to talk about this than to do it, but the Lord can give us the strength and grace to do these things. Criticism of others. Sin perpetuates itself. How cruel then it is for those who claim to have a knowledge of God to show that they are not doers of his word. They indulge in evil thinking, criticizing and accusing, and in this way they misrepresent Christ's character. They are false witnesses, just as were the Jews. I pray that the vision of the soul may be sanctified, that the sin of accusing and criticizing may be put away as a sin that crucifies afresh the Son of God and puts him to an open shame. The Holy Spirit must work in our hearts. Let no false pride, no Phariseeism be cherished. Rather, let us seek for the spirit of a little child. If we knew, if we only knew how the Lord regards those who indulge so freely in evil surmising, we would fear to manifest such a spirit. These surmisings are a repast from the enemy, a banquet of his own preparing. Those who give place to them have an experience in accordance with them, for the mind is built up from the food given it. So if we are going around evil surmising about others, we will see the bad in them and this perpetuates an evil critical spirit in us so that our minds and our characters are damaged by it. And so often we do this, it's not necessarily about people that have hurt or upset us, it's often our spouse or those closest to us that we're critical of. Jovial talking. From the light which the Lord has given me, our sisters should pursue a very different course. They should be more reserved manifest less boldness and encourage in themselves shamefacedness and sobriety. Both brethren and sisters indulge in too much jovial talk when in each other's society. Women professing godliness indulge in much jesting, joking and laughing. This is unbecoming and grieves the Spirit of God. These exhibitions reveal a lack of true Christian refinement. They do not strengthen the soul in God, but bring great darkness. They drive away the pure, refined, heavenly angels and bring those who engage in these wrongs down to a low level. So that's something we need to watch when we're in each other's company, that we don't joke and jest and laugh over much. There are situations that are funny that we can laugh at, and we've touched on this before, but so often it, it goes to excess. And it's unbecoming and it grieves the Spirit of God. And we know when the Lord is calling to our hearts that we're going too far. Another downfall for women is looking at our emotions. And this is something, especially with hormones and different, <laughs> different things, that we have to guard against because we too often give way to our emotions and use that as an excuse for our behavior. I have indeed been halting under the shadow of the cross. It is not a common thing for me to be overpowered and to suffer so much depression of spirit as I have suffered for the last few months. I would not teach that Jesus has risen from the tomb and that he's ascended on high and lives to make intercession for us before the Father unless I carry out my teaching by practice and believe in him for his salvation, casting my helpless soul upon Jesus for grace, for righteousness, peace and love. I must trust in him irrespective of the changes of my emotional atmosphere. So it's comforting for me when I came across this quote that Ellen White herself had problems with depression. This is early on in her experience. But every one of us is tempted to be discouraged, to be overwhelmed by situations and circumstances. And it's a, it's a, it's a discipline to train ourselves to trust in God regardless of how we feel. There are other statements which say that faith is distinct from feeling as the east is from the west. So how far is the east from the west is, is how different they are. So even when we're feeling down, it doesn't mean that we don't have faith. She's saying that we need to trust in Christ even when we feel down, especially when we feel down, that we have to break through that darkness into the light. And sometimes when we're praying, it's by faith we get off our knees because we don't always feel better, but by faith we can say that Christ is still with us. So finally, ending as we usually do on this quote, remember that Christ is our happiness. The presence of Christ alone can make men and women happy. 
all the common waters of life Christ can turn into the wine of heaven. The home then becomes as an Eden of bliss, the family, a beautiful symbol of the family in heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we as women have been entrusted with a work to do for you. We thank you for the way that you look upon being a wife and a mother, how much counsel you've given us to do these roles successfully, and how much you want to bless us in them. Help and guide each one of us, as many of us are single, but some may be married already, that you would bless each of us here, guide us to the right person, that our homes truly might be a taste of heaven. We ask that you would continue to bless us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen.